James chapter 3 verses 1 to 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Today it's all about the tongue. And my theme for this morning is that our fruits or our produce or our words reflect who we are. So, I'm very bad with names. My family is here, so they'll tell you. So I was very happy one day at UWC when I was busy studying. And after class, I met a distant, let me call him a distant relative. And I was so happy that I remembered his name. I kept saying it over and over again. And the name I had in my mind was Rocco. So I kept saying, yes, Rocco, yes, Rocco, yes, Rocco. And then we said goodbye. And as I left, I realized that this can't be Rocco. Rocco is a, you know, there's a, a character from one of those little books, um, black and white um, story, um, feature stories that we had as children. And it turns out his name wasn't Rocco, it's Roscoe. And um, so I was the joke of the family when I told them this. And obviously, um, I was quite embarrassed about that. Today we're looking at the third installment in the, uh, on the series of the book of James. And we were told that we should be not only hearers of the word, but also doers. And we should have a living faith that produced good works. Now James obviously was on, not only a disciple of Jesus, but also his younger brother. But coming back to the tongue, we all know how a liquor juicy gossip story starts. It normally starts with, did you hear? Or in Afrikaans, he gave a word. Now James uses very strong language to caution us about the dangers of not controlling our tongues. He provides examples of a horse and a ship being controlled by a small component so that it is easy to make them go in the right direction. He then goes on to say that the tongue is also a small component of the body and yet it controls the body. And this is what he says. The tongue makes great boasts. It's a fire, a world of evil. It corrupts the body, sets the whole course of life on fire 
It is itself set on fire by hell, no less. No human being can tame it. A restless evil full of deadly poison. In verses 9 to 10, he goes on, he says, With a tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with the very same tongue we curse human beings made in God's likeness. From the same mouth come praise and cursing. And then he says, My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Again, let me repeat. Our words reflect who we are. We produce what we are. Fig trees do not produce olives. Now it's important to remember how powerful words are. In Genesis we see how God speaks creation into being. E.g., for, for example, let there be light, and there was light. Covenants with Abraham and Israel were done through words. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. Now, obviously, the reference here is to Jesus Christ. Jesus is called the Word. Moses returned from the mountain with words inscribed on stone tablets by God. And there we have the Ten Commandments. Jesus taught us to pray by giving us the right words to say in the Our Father. And before His ascension, Jesus left the disciples with these words, or with the words of the Great Commission. Go to all nations and make them my disciples. Baptize them and teach them to obey everything that I have taught you. So needless to say that words are an essential and critical part of our faith. How often do we hear of concerned loved ones asking for prayer for family members who are sick in hospital, especially at this time with COVID-19? We believe that our prayers through faith would cause God's healing to manifest in the bodies of those people who are ill and restore them to health. Words are powerful. Now, I can almost say the tongue in itself, or I can say it, doesn't produce any words. There's a person behind the tongue. The tongue sits inside of somebody. And before words are formed, we go through a thought process. Now, I know often we say people speak before they think, but it, it doesn't really happen. You have to think about something before you can speak it. The words are formed in our brain. Now, I worked at Paul's Moore as a professional nurse, and I consulted with an HIV positive um, um, inmate and as he left the door, he went outside around the building and I forgot to say something to him, so I just shouted through the window. But all I said to him was, remember you must all come for a urine test. Now to me those were harmless words and it didn't reveal any personal or medical information about him. I just said, remember, you need to come for a medical test. But he left, and I thought that was the end of that. Sometime later, when we uh, had another consultation, he said to me, you know those words hurt me so much that I actually sat at the spot where you passed every day to go to the subclinic in the housing units, and I sat there with a knife. But two people came to me, two guys came to me and asked me, what are you doing? And when I told them, they said, please don't do this. Well, I was obviously very relieved because I passed here every day. But I just said to him, you know, I believe that was God who sent those two angels to protect me. But the moral of that story is that words that seem harmless to me, 
is not necessarily harmless to the people on the other end, the person who's receiving it. So one should always put yourself in the shoes of the other person. Our emotions, feelings, and attitudes form parts of those thoughts that eventually produce words. Think of a mother asking a child for the millionth time to clean the room, or someone crying for help, a boy speaking to his girlfriend in loving tones, or someone shouting a warning of fire when lives and property are at risk. These are all different scenarios. The thought processes are different, and the words are different. But coming back to James, when James says, my brothers and sisters, this should not be so. I believe that James is saying, we have control over what we say and do. So these feelings and thoughts and emotions and the thought process is what we have control over. So that we have the ability to be the good Christian people that we have chosen to be. Good Christian people who produce the words that good Christian people say. Our words reflect who we are. So how do we turn this situation around? Firstly, we must view speech as an incredible responsibility. When we realize that our words define us and cause harm or build up people, we cannot simply carry on dropping words recklessly wherever or whenever. Words are powerful. It should come with a warning, use with caution. Secondly, we must be aware of our vulnerability when we speak. How easily we fall into sin. Harmless words equate to sin. White lies, angry words, half-truths, or even withholding the truth. This requires spiritual maturity to avoid the trap. Avoid people who gossip all the time. And be bold enough to say, sorry, I do not want to hear it. Thirdly, remember that words are powerful. Take care when producing them. Put them through quality control before releasing them into the world. Before we forward the WhatsApp that tells people it is dangerous to take the vaccine. Consider the facts. Those in Western Cape hospitals who are seriously ill have not been vaccinated. None of those vaccinated suffer from serious illness. And they recover from the disease. So let us stay clear of fake news. In order to tame the tongue, we need to allow God to change our hearts. Unless this happens, we will continue producing the words that are true to our nature. True change of heart coincides with the change in speech, integrity, honesty, truthfulness, godliness, gentleness, and love. In Luke 6, verse 45, a good man, out of the treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. We need to live under the influence of the Holy Spirit daily. Lastly, we should continuously be aware that our tongue must be controlled by being truthful, by being loving, by being sincere. And also, we should be protective of God's name. How often do we hear OMG or oh my word and unnecessary references to God? God's name must be revered and respected at all cost. In conclusion then, my brothers and sisters, let us imitate Jesus by speaking truth and spreading love and joy. Let's build up ourselves and others. I'm reminded again of the beautiful word admonish. 
to put others right in a caring way and using words responsibly. Let's not underestimate the power of our words to make the world a better place, to bring life and hope. Let us allow ourselves to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit so that what we say and do will truly reflect who we are in Christ so that we will fulfill our desired destiny as members of God's kingdom. When we are able to speak life into situations, build up others, spread the good news, and talk about God's goodness to others, then we can turn around the words of James. Remember, James spoke in very negative terms. So that, with the same tongue, we praise God and speak life and joy into other human beings who are created in God's likeness. And James will say, my brothers and sisters, this is how it should be. We produce, produce good fruit because we are good trees. Amen. Amen.